relax. I think so. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Dig It Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Walsh, and today we got awesome guest Austin Wasserman of High Level Throwing in the house, who's back for season two. And um, just a quick funny story, last season, you know, we, we communicate like, hey, coach, would love to have you on. You're like, sure, let me know a date. Boom. We meet up. We start talking on the Zoom, small talk. And next thing you know, I'm like, all right, coach, like, we're going to get this podcast rocking momentarily. And Coach Austin's like, wait, what? Like, we're doing this right now? Like, are you serious? I'm like, wait, no. Like, yeah, we're doing this. What do you mean? And he's like, yo, I, I didn't know we were doing the Zoom right now. I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't call you up just to chop it up on a Zoom. I would have hit you up on a phone call. So we we did better <laughs> this season. We organized the time and we 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 still had some, you know, we had we were both fathers and we got some new navigations to work through. But we're here, Coach Austin Wasserman. Welcome back to the Dig It podcast. Yes, sir. Drew, thanks for having me. Appreciate that. Thanks for prefacing uh podcast <laughs> with that story uh, i had to i thought about it earlier i was like that was funny we were both just sitting yeah, there just, staring at each other I, like I, I, uh... thought, I thought you wanted to be professional from the start so i hopped on ready to rock <laughs> <laughs> no i gotta no i'll figure it out day by day um that was funny but i had to throw that in coach it's been about a year since we kind of at least you've been on this podcast i did have the opportunity that's it really it's been a year Ooh. Was it you no know, last year? You know what I mean? It was a month ago, so we're just rocking off. No, no, no. <laughs> I did see you last year, which was late last year. Finally, That's I right. got to meet you in person. Coach Austin Washman came out to San Diego. It was literally like eight minutes from my house. So I was able to kind of swing by and get to see how the high level throwing clinics unfold. And it was just absolutely amazing to see athletes out there working on sequencing, good movement patterns, throwing well. And it was awesome. Like I, I knew you were awesome to begin with, but to see it uh, live and unfold, it was amazing. Um, anyhow, that. my man, welcome back yes, to the Big Podcast. Where are you at right yep. now? You in Florida? I'm, Where yeah. are you? Yeah, I'm in South Florida. I'm in South Florida. Um, I'm in uh, Deerfield Beach, uh, training out of a D1 training facility. So I do some assessments here and start to pick up in the summertime and in the fall. But uh, I've been traveling a lot with our clinics and we have a you know, pretty uh, heavy spring with athletes and coaches wanting to learn about high level throwing, you know, check out the movements, the drills, and really how to implement it and integrate it into their own practices and, you know, pregame routines and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I've been, I've been good. It's it's a little chilly here in Florida, but, you know, it's all good. I hear that. So, l listen, go back to season one, guys, if you're listening now. It was an amazing podcast. It was a lot of in-depth stuff on, like, your background story and and how you got to where you are today. Um, but I did see Gatorade player of the year when I was, I, I that was a fun fact that I saw recently. Like that would, that must've yeah. been pretty exciting. Gatorade player of the year is like yeah. an incredible, um, a, incredible award to have won. Must've been decent at baseball. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it was 2002 and you know, it was in New Hampshire. So what a year, you know, what a year. I think, it, I think, I think John Lester was that year, Gatorade player of the year. I don't want to um, hear that as a Boston Red Sox, man. Come on. You know, are New Hampshire, I so I guess that makes sense. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, so I, I had that. I, you know, I, I, I was a decent ball player, a de decent athlete. So I um, was there, and then I, I got an opportunity to play at University of New Orleans, uh, played there for two years, and transferred to UConn, and that's kind of where I really grew as a player, as a person, as a – Go Huskies. Edu as an educator, go Huskies. So, um, you know, I graduated from UConn, and then – got my master's degree in clinical nutrition and uh, started training athletes really just locally in New Hampshire. And over time just started to evolve and get more clients, get more athletes, um, help them with strength, growing movement. And um, it's just evolved over time. So really cool to see um, how, you know, when I started in 2008 till, you know, 2024, it's been a long journey of, you know, training and programming and you know, trying to, figure stuff out, what works, what doesn't work, um, lots of talking and networking and, you know, trying to, trying to, you know, improve a skill that's really challenging to teach. And obviously there's lots of injuries that can come from it. So, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been quite a ride and it's fun and we're continuing to get better and improve and try and help coaches and athletes all over the world, really. Coach, you guys are doing something so impactful for the baseball and softball community. Just to tie it back in, like I discovered you several years ago and mm -hmm. 
you know, I, I took took a liking right away because we speak similar languages as far as like our Kinesis background or training background and then our baseball background. So like we kind of see movers and then we see an infielder or like, right. We could see two an athlete from two different lenses. So it was really refreshing to see how you spoke about throwing and how you kind of, you're the first person that I know of that's ever put a curriculum behind not only throwing, but more so specific, like sport, like spe- position specific throwing, right? Like a lot of people, when they think of throwing, they immediately think of pitching. All right. I, I get sure. it. That makes sense. Right. Pitchers are a premium and that, 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 that makes sense, but you've done such a great job of breaking each position down, but then starting like a parent could go to your website and kind of check it out and, and start to learn about their son or daughter's throwing journey. So I think, yeah. you know, kudos to you. Thank you so much for all that you do for the baseball and Thank softball you. community. And we're going to get to what you got going on and how everybody could, could, you know, continue to learn from your content. But, um, you know, first, first season, we talked about like how you kind of came to this throwing journey and for the listeners, you know, Austin was working with everybody, right. He's working with infielders, outfielders, hitting infielders. And, you know, he came across someone having a lot of difficulty throwing and obviously baseball, softball is a catch and throw sport. And it kind of, that's kind of where it all started. And I, I kind of want to open it up to like, listen, there's still a lot of people that have a lot of issues with overhand throwing. There's, it's such a complex skill. So if my son or daughter, like what, what common mistakes do you see in the throwing a- uh, action? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, I would say in the, the biggest thing that I see and it's whether it's, you know, baseball or softball, it's, we want athletes to move well first. So and I'm going to get to like what, what the common things are, but when I look at an athlete and I see them warm up, I'm watching them perform a dynamic warm up. Like I want to see how they do a karaoke or a shuffle or a lunge with a rotation and a side lunge. That's going to tell me a ton of information if they're going to move really well in this really complex overhand throwing skill. So I always, you know, kind of look at that as an overall, just kind of picture, just like a snapshot of like, okay, I kind of see of what, you know, kind of see what I'm going to be working with right now, or I'm going to be evaluating. Um, but the biggest mistakes or the, the most common throwing issues, I would say it's, I would say it's probably, there's three things that are big issues. Um, the first one is athletes, I think, aren't aware of how their hips and their torso should really work or how their upper body should counter rotate and how fast it needs to get out of that, you know, kind of counter rotation over mm-hmm. that load based on the position, based on the situation, you know, speed of play, all of that stuff. So I think there's a, there's a lack of understanding or awareness of that, hip to trunk relationship, I call it, you know, you call it separation or tension or whatever you want to say, but I think that's a big piece. Um, I also think that there's a, a huge misunderstanding of how like you're supposed to load the arm back and how your arm is supposed to unravel through ball release. You know, we've got a lot of like choppy, like awkward pauses and then a lot of like collapses, weird push patterns with their wrists so you know like wrist flicks and l drills unfortunately you know kind of created some really robotic static awkward movers you know and you might have a really athletic kid and just like you set them up like that they become very unathletic really fast so you know those are yeah we got a lot to unpack there let me before i forget Mm -hmm. i didn't drink and i drank a lot of coffee not that much before i forget trunk Right. The 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 shoulder hip, the hip, hip relationship. Yeah. Right. Like. For me, like some concepts, like if, if I would have put both of my hands across my shoulders and I didn't move my hips, but I turned my shoulders to my right, you would start to see striations in my shirt. The the angles in my shirt would change. And um, that's that's resistance. That's loading of your core. That's building tension of your trunk. Right. Uh, through separating hips and shoulders 
So that's just such a, I think though stability is a skill. Like our ability to stabilize the waist down is a skill. Sure. It's a, it, you have to like, like you said, the, the global mover has to be taught first then sure. to connect this such as fine motor skill um, to add on top of that global movement. Yeah. So, okay. So like, say we taught. I was going to say, that's why rotation needs to be trained at a young age, young kids learning, you know, learning how to like swing a bat, you know, swing a golf club, just throw anything, learn how to sequence their body. Cause once you put a ball in their hand, they're going to figure out like, Oh, my body's been doing that since I was like three years old, or five years old or seven years or whatever it is. So now I just know how to rotate and sequence my body. So that's, I just want to make sure we can start that earlier. Later. Yes. Coach. Is that why, is that why in some videos you may see you have athletes with tennis rackets or what, talk to me about how you, you know, it, it's as basic yeah. as rotating, but what do you got? Yeah. The tennis racket drill is kind of a combination of a couple things. It will help an athlete, you know, rotate just because you're forcing them to into that pattern. But really the goal is to get athletes that push the ball athletes that are like that drop their elbow, you know, when they come through the throwing zone, it really helps them to get their elbow up over their shoulder as they rotate through the throwing zone. So instead of like the coaching cue of get your elbow up, like we don't want to do this or up is relative coach, this. right? So I, I I try right. not to teach in arbitrary terms because like it's super subjective to everybody. Right. Obviously, there's there's segments in coaching you have to keep a little gray for the individuality mm -hmm. of it. But mm -hmm. like when you say elbow up, like when I say elbow, like I, you just did it, but I see too many infielders it's, miss down, right? Like they miss down exactly. because they unravel action reaction, right? Exactly. Unravel too too low or or their pattern is their load is off. But when when we start with like a static setup when like the elbow is like high up above the shoulder plane, like that's what I mean by like elbow. Yes. This way. Um, or like internally rotate your shoulder and then like drive your elbow up, which is obviously some impingement stuff happening there. But anytime you do those movements, the tendency for most athletes is going to be to like drop the elbow to unravel to release the ball. So, you know, that's a tricky thing because you can't get full external rotation when you're pushing the ball. You, it's almost like a, like a tricep. Extension. Yes. Yes. yes versus yes, yes. like an external rotation throw. So, you know, how we load the arm back and how we unravel the arm forward. That's really what the tennis racket drill is for. Also, obviously to help, you know, with, with rotation back, and rotation forward. So, I mean, there's a lot of I love it. things the drill can the drill can create. I want. I was curious. I wanted to to hear why you guys use it, and and I love yeah. it. And like, there's no there's no dumb drill unless it's all about the application of it, right? Like, there's there's That's some dumb drills, yeah. <laughs> but like, you know what I mean? Like the I don't. We'll we'll, we'll save that for later. But, sure. but when 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 you talk about the loading part of throwing, elaborate on that. It's just like a general like standardized throw. Yeah. So just say like a shuffle throw from an infielder, like ball in the glove, and then a shuffle throw from an outfielder, ball in the glove. So typically we're trying to load the the whole arm through the shoulder blade. So the shoulder blade scapular is going to like work along the rib cage as your arm goes out and as your stride goes forward so your loading pattern is basically like how does your body rotate counter rotate how does your shoulder blade load the arm back and then how does the glove side like work out so as an infielder or catcher that would be kind of like you know patterns your shoulder blade is loading and setting the shoulder joint for the shoulder blade the throw essentially from an outfield setting or standpoint instead of going straight you know back or you know kind of more like a catcher infielder the athlete would extend the arm down and then load through the shoulder blade 
before they come forward. So you're still gaining access to the shoulder blade. It's just a longer, like a longer arm action before you come forward. Love so. that. And when when you think about that, we've talked about it on the last podcast, like there are two different throwers. There's two different time sensitivities. There's two different striders. So, you know, you talk, you think about the best infielders, infielders in the world, all catch, you know, on a routine ground ball, catch ball middle, bring ball middle, separate ball middle, and throw with a quiet, quiet head, quiet eyes, meaning their 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 head for more for more or less stays over the middle of their spine versus that big yank of their head to the side of their, their glove side. And their arm is now unraveling in ways we may not want it that will keep us efficient or consistent. So, you know, you think about like we that's why we you know, that's why we do daily hand path work, guys, is just to make sure we understand not only where the ball is in our glove to get a good grip, but we need to try our best to keep that ball middle and then take the ball middle, which is two different movements. Catching the ball and bringing ball middle are two two different movements that have to once we get good at them blend as one. Would you agree? Yeah. No, I, I think you touched on something of identifying movements. And and I've been doing a lot more identifying characteristics of like outfielders, of infielders, of catchers. What do their movements look like? What do their arm pathways look like? Because again, it's going to, you know, for the most part, in like a routine ground ball or routine fly ball or throw a runner out, you want them to be very consistent but you know, you're not going to get a perfectly, you know, hit ground ball, fly ball. So you have to learn how to adjust your body, your arm, obviously based on, you know, what is happening in front of you for sure. So, you know, so man, let's, uh, let's start to get into some more like infield specific stuff of like, mm-hmm. you know, you got, you got the internal clocks, speed of running time, speed of ball. You got shelf of ball, meaning the height, of the ball comes in within your, your fielding zone. Um, you have th- like type of throw. We have like off the script, off foot throws on the run throws. Right. And then we have throws where we're throwing through momentum. And then we have throws where we're redirecting momentum is how, like, well, I kind of look at it and there's two very different throws for, for basic example, like a throwing through momentum would be like a, a glove side routine ground ball. We go right, left catch. And our momentum's taking us to our target, right? So, like, we don't want to stop that momentum. We want to sustain it. And then we got balls that take us away from our target, i.e. backhand, where we might not have time to get through it, and we have to catch it and redirect that ball. And um, they're two very – they're rotational throws, but they're very different in nature. One is is more fluid, and and then the other one is way more static. Mm -hmm. Any input on that real before I continue to ramble? Yeah, no, you're good. I like I like those movements. I like adding and and I think you sent me, you know, we're texting, you sent me some videos of stuff you're doing and and I, I like a lot of the the movement into throws. So like yes, going forward, but also like stepping to the side or like shuffling to the side to throw or backpedaling to throw or like a step back to throw. Why do you like, so like back why do you like backpedal so much? I, I like backpedal just from like a back, like a like a hard hit ball that maybe like kicks up that you have to stop and then throw from almost like a like a standstill, but you're working backwards on that throw. But I just I just think that as you're like stepping backwards, it's almost that staggered stance off foot type throw. So you're getting some resistance between your pelvis and your and your torso. So I think I like the back throws are, you know, really nicely for infielders, even like shuffling to the right, shuffle to the left. We used to do a, like a quarterback, like a, like a quarterback, you know, hit the glove, spin around and like throw on the run to your right. So just to get these athletes moving into different directions, you know, I always think about like the shortstop, like pump fake, go to third on, you know, runner on first and second. <laughs> like I always think I about that, that play just for like, <laughs> you know, like the half kneeling turn and throw, but you can start to add, you know, get your athletes around second base and work those patterns 
with more context, you know, behind it. So I love that. And I, and I love the freedom, right? The creativity, like there's got to be basic stuff. Like you got to have two feet anchored to the earth and we have to explore where our joints are. We have to explore where our posture is. We have to explore where our hands are with our feet. We have to explore point of rotation. So, but once you start getting there, like even if they're not ready for it, I still expose kids to throwing on the run. Like when do you, totally. I don't, when are they ever going to get ready for it? Like when they, it's not you like when it. you graduate eighth grade and you walk across the stage, they're like, congratulations, you now can throw on the run. It doesn't right. work like that. We got to figure yeah. out like, this is a long process and it's freaking hard. So totally. I actually think it's more dangerous not to expose a kid to throwing windows and slots early on than to when they get stronger, have more horsepower, more ingrained in their pathways than to when they're super malleable and young and loosey goosey. So they love it too, by the way. Kids love throwing on the run if you haven't noticed. Yeah. Um yeah, yeah, even have them like have them sit sit down on their butts to make a throw or lay on their stomach like start in their stomach with the ball in their hand, get up, make a throw, you know, amazing. Pretend that you dove to roll. You know, you can start these kids off in different setups. And it lets it empowers them to explore their communication with the earth. Like how do I get my feet moving around my hips with like, how do I use the earth versus it? Like, like you see a kid who falls and then uses the earth like a trampoline versus a kid Mm -hmm. who's like in 18 pieces. You're like, bro, we got, we got to figure out some rolling stuff here, some rhythm stuff body awareness before we go down more rabbit holes like i love let's talk about like i think i'll put i'll put you're the guest here we go Mm -hmm. what's the difference between what does it look like when someone's throwing through momentum like like organ like unraveling wise and then redirecting momentum that could be a bad question too and i could help you out i mean i'm just trying like i'm i'm trying to get into your brain so just from wait you redirected a question so you re- redirected that? <laughs> no, I'm answering it. I'm answering it. I'm um, saying a moment, a momentum throw. I'm thinking of two different things. Like one would be like an infield routine ground ball, like right, left, throw through like a couple steps afterwards. Yeah. Like yeah. plays over or an outfield run through, like there's a runner on second, you're going through, you field it off the left side of your foot. You're doing a run through creating momentum going toward the target for a, a play that again might be stopped or like a, a back play for me is like as an infielder it's either like a one hop smash to your right where you're like you're going back or one of my favorites is say that like it's a backhand and it spins you around where you have to get up and make a throw so it's kind of like it has like a back element and then a forward transition element with that. So I don't know what your thoughts on now on, on those. We're on the same page. We have like we have the one smashed here, right? Where it's like a hot shot, and I think they're the same yeah. same mechanism. It's just we, we call it like lane six, where you have to run in, like it's an on the run backhand at shortstop, taking you to the third baseline, like like almost mm-hmm. horizontally or back, and you have to mm-hmm. feel that ball out in front of your left foot, reposition your feet, and you throw it in the same space that you fielded the ball. Um, and you have to trust that turn. You have to stay tall. You have to snap your hips to get that backspin carry because uh, you don't have time to follow, right? Mm-hmm. That's the one. And I didn't even think of that one that like is hard glove side and it's kind of taking your midline more towards left field. And it doesn't make sense to have to turn back into that momentum or fight that momentum and fly open. So just sustain that momentum through. And then once you get your right left, let it eat. And then we have the ball going glove side. So when I started thinking about like going glove side, like in sustaining momentum, like how like how you organize the unraveling of those, I think has to be different on a consistent basis. Because if I'm going to my right, it's such a volitional high intent throw. Like my my stride length is gonna be is gonna be I don't know about stride length necessarily, coach, but it's gonna be more of like a back hip driven throw. So like sure. I need to get separation and then that front side is going to be a, a pretty volitional clear outside of my torso to get full extension rotation into that throw. Like I'm getting everything from my lower half into that throw because I need it every inch of that, sure. Ver, you know, like, so meaning if you're just listening to this and I separate my hands middle and then I go to rotate, my glove gets almost like outside of my, my left chest. Like I fully tuck or clear that glove Cause like, it's a, again, like I said, a high intent throw or volitional throw. 
And then if I'm going glove side and say it's just a medium hop, like ball staying below my waist, somewhere around my knees, I'm coming in with a lot of momentum. Mm-hmm. Now we got to start to look at a few different things like, A, I, I don't want to catch the ball and bring that ball all the way up above my shoulder per se because the game might not allow me to, right? And then also if sure. I get tall, I don't I don't handle lateral momentum as well. So if I, if I could stay in posture, which is something like we call like level two, level one, and figure out a nice low window or lower window that allows me to stay there athletic. And then from there, like I'm still going to catch the ball middle, ideally, right? Two yep. hands. And then I'm going to separate the ball. But now um, the biggest differentiator with that glove side on these throws is that glove's going to unravel right back into my chest. Right. So like you see the Japanese do this. so freaking nice. Right. They separate their hands and it's almost like they take their palm right to the middle of their chest in between their chest. Okay. And I think that, and then you see, you see a really aggressive move from their hips, but you don't see their head move much. Right. Their eyes stay really still as like that left foot anchors briefly or left hip anchors. And then that right hip snaps through and doesn't stop because we have momentum that we want to sustain through our target. So that's where, like, I think that's a big difference in skill. Like, I, yeah. like, so how do you, what do you got? I also, I also see like the glove side, just like clear, like peeling actually on some, like on the run, like when they're, when their spine angle is really low. So there's like a, you had said it before, like you have one where it's like, okay, it's to the rib cage, like clear to the armpit. And you have one where you're on the run and there's like, it's right against your body. But there's also one where there, I've seen it again, like more of a characteristic of like that glove sides out, it clears that they need, this athlete needs to do that in order to fully like rotate their hips and fully rotate their torso. So I feel like there's, they're compensating for, some you know inefficient movement and then their body is making up for it so like this instead of coming to the chest it's kind of just clearing to allow their you know their rib cage their torso to rotate efficiently for them so again i think it's you got the wheels turning coach so i'm just thinking yeah. about like now there's differences like if i'm if i'm on the run and i'm running like say i, I feel i'm at shortstop infield in i'm running to home i'm throwing the home plate right mm-hmm. and i'm going that way I start to look at like contralateral stuff, right? Cause you have to, mm-hmm. if you look at rotation. So like you see the right sure. arm throwing and then you see what the left hip does, right? Like you kind of just mm-hmm. see how they organize that rhythm or if they can yeah. or not. So, but I noticed like if I'm going A to B North South, like mm-hmm. I just, my left toe, my left leg stays longer and moves sure. forward with that. Cause it's like such a quick tight throw and it's not much, it's not as much like coiling. It's just kind of like, it's a, a sure. quick coil go. Tight decel. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But then if I, I see you going just... away from your target, it's like a cross. Like it's a aggressive totally. volitional collision of my shoulders into my front knee. To your point though about that long front side, I do see that, but I always, see, with those ones, I see the left wrist always stays in the middle. Like it's like it's not a full here. Like they they get there yeah, and when they clear. throw, it's still comes they like stay middle. Their, their hips, yeah, for sure. And I think you know ball hit to your left, like glove side. Like I think that on the run, like that's something too that that glove starts to work tighter to the body. It's not like a ah, it's you know because coach like on that throw up the middle, you know. I don't so think you have like, time to separate your hands. Can't you just like you're almost like spinning, you know, up the same like, thing with a double play. Mm-hmm. Like you don't have time to go this way, right? Because like you're going to be on your front hip already. It's um the, the timing just changes. Instead of that, it's just like you have to incorporate. Like now you're adding context. Like if you just do this, okay. But if you do this, now you're adding your hips, your torso with that load to like set your hand, set your, you know, so it's, again, if you have a backhand, yeah, load it. Boom. If you're on the run, like this, like is almost your load versus like, but when you have kids that don't know how to rotate and load and glove side, you got to start somewhere. And then yes, 
refined, we went on a tangent of like we kind of went to chapter nine really quick but like it's all good i guess a big a big common mistake i see with little uh baseballers is like they have no idea their front side that they're they're so consumed with the throwing side arm right that like mm -hmm. they just get very you know it's right wrist right elbow right shoulder and that's all they care about that this front side kind of just flops all over the place and you'll just see like a really tall thrower you'll see a really loud head you'll see a really inconsistent unraveler and I think it causes so many timing issues with it. Like you add the fielding act to this because they have to catch the ball yeah. and then get that slot all the way up there. And you, it's really tough to follow your throw from here. Right. Yeah, You're yeah, just not in a great. Yeah. So, you know, those are some of the biggest things like I see with the, if we could just clean up our infielders front side. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's just going to, I never really talk about the throwing side arm unless it's like in a plyo setting or like it's in a one-on-one -on -one setting real quick. Cause I just think right. a lot of um, mechanical flaws could be cleaned up by, okay, let's separate, right? Like maybe keep your left elbow slightly in front of your shoulder, keep that thumb down to low tension, mm -hmm. keep this nice and tight. Um, and then let's just work on unraveling with a, a tight front side and see what that does. And like, they'll do it. And if they do it good at first, it, it's very like they don't they're not aggressive and they'll do it i'm like yo right. be really aggressive like, like clear that front side and you'll see the ball fly out and i'm like mm -hmm. was that harder or softer way harder did you try to throw it harder no i was just aggressive with my front side you'll start to see a better rotator yeah. with their because of the front hip right like that that front elbow is the front hip right and it really accelerates sure. that back hip through hop in there yeah no i like um i like doing like soccer throw-ins and like like chop slams with medicine balls just to, before they start to throw, if they have an issue with that, because then it starts to clean up their sequence, how they actually like come through the throwing zone. Um, but I think too, I think getting a ball out of the athlete's hand when they're contralateral tilting and you put them in a different type of, you know, specific drill that forces body posture in a different way. So like a soccer throw in, chop slam maybe it's like holding on to a band behind you like it's like shifting like shifting your torso understanding how your your torso is supposed to rotate back and forth and in, in a certain angle so i think that's what i would do first and then start to get you know baseball and softballs in their hand if we're doing this weird transitional like side bend tilt and we'll talk about like we'll we'll put a PVC pipe around their shoulders and figure out like we'll mm -hmm. just be like all right rotate around your spine versus above your spine and just tell me what you feel different and then and then maybe we'll add a ball just because listen again we're dealing with movers that like if they're there they're far away from you being able to just say lower your arm right like or, or stop right. throwing with your head like over here like they're way right. way way far away from that like they need a yeah. lot of intervention constraints to get to a point where they could absorb that skill. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you think about like, there's just a lot of timing. Like when you see movers that are heavy on their front side, like when they throw the ball and they're really heavy on that left foot, what are some, some thoughts there? Like, what do you typically, what's the cause of that? Well, sometimes, um, I mean, there's a couple of things, but we see like a, a trail leg that also like, flies forward with their stride so like their chest their torso is kind of out in front and then that back leg doesn't really anchor doesn't really rotate the right way so it's almost like it's like a hip extension and then like a so like a hip flexion like you've seen this before like that back yes. leg just like shoots Drag. through drags through or like you know it just it doesn't look like the torso is rotating and it looks like like the leg and the backside is all like going in one piece and it's not like segmental, you know, like torso and then the leg yes. popping up after residual movement or residual rotation. So um, I mean, I know there's some, some stuff out there that correlates some elbow issues with a, a trail leg flexion kind of moving forward. So that's just a, you know, it's a tough thing to focus on, but it could be a, a lack of hip strength. It could be a, you know, lack of lead leg stability. It could be a whole bunch of 
different issues of or, why they're coach. It could be before they it could be before they caught the ball, right? If they're going into a right left catch and they're super light on their right hip and don't know how to load their right hip and then completely get to their front side. That's going to be sure. their 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 uh, compensation or default mechanism of moving into that throw. So it's like heavy, light, heavy, light, and then the ball is out on that like light back hip, which you want to be more heavy. Yeah, um, loaded. Could, yes, and I also think it's like I, yo, you're. Yeah, I think it's I think in softball too. Just athletes have gotten away, or I would say gotten away. I would say I would say gotten away with it because the field is is shorter so like leaning forward the perception of like i gotta get the ball forward but you're not actually loading the hip and sequencing and like loading the arm properly everything's like out in front and it creates this kind of push weird awkward pattern and then you get moved to the outfield position or a catcher and you're like i can't throw because i've been an infielder my entire life or second base or shortstop or third and i've just been getting away with this like it's jumping out in front, lead, you know, kind of like heavy front leg. It's just interesting. Yeah. I mean, super see baseball too, but. Yeah. They just have a little more time. Me and Coach Morgan Stewart talking about this. Like, it's yeah. just softball is such an amazing sport. I love watching it. But I think now having trained like youth softballers, it's such a chaotic sport that it it, it really starts to – like breed bad patterns and bad timing because like they don't have it. So they, they, they compensate in ways and just get the ball out. And I listen, sure. I get it. That's your job. Ultimate job is a catch ball and throw. But sure. we coach a nine year old, 12 year old to be really good at 14. So mm-hmm. it's like, if we could just figure out how to, to, to understand back and front hip, understand weight transfer, understand rotation, sequencing, from different torso tilts, like I swear it's going to pay off in two, three years. And it's just tough to reverse habits. It, it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's difficult. Like I see a lot of softballers when they catch the ball, the ball is brought back to their, like they'll, they'll just bend their left elbow at catch glove side elbow, right. and they'll flex their elbow right to their right shoulder. And then action reaction is this, like they'll just like, it's almost like if you look at, if I'm holding the ball in the middle of my body and my, I'm looking to my left and you would have create an X looking at me in front of me through my left mm-hmm. shoulder, through my right hip, right shoulder, through my left hip. Like if I get someone who's breaks on like a, on either of those platter, like uh, X patterns diagonally, mm-hmm. like it's going to cause a lot of compensation and we're going to road. It's not going to be true rotation. So we kind of talk about staying somewhere closer to the middle, draw a straight line through that X, rotate through the middle of that X and you could kind of tilt a little bit of course, but if, if we're high this way or this, we're in trouble. Yeah. No, I think, you know, in baseball, everyone throws overhand. In softball, you have pitchers that, you know, have an underhand movement, it's a fast pitch movement that's different than all the other positions. So when we're, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, we want to see who pitches, right? Like who's a pitch? So in baseball, everyone's doing the same movement. Softball, you get. You know, yes. everyone trying to do this and no, and not everyone doing like loading patterns. So a lot of the pitchers, like a lot of softball athletes, just like they, they like try to do their pitching movement with their chest, you know, because they're learning. They don't yes. know how to use. But they forget that like when they go to throw, they do the same thing and they don't actually like load their hips and their torso. So that's why like every softball player should learn how to throw first to learn how to coil the hips, load the back hip, and, like, you know, load the, to- the torso back before they start this movement because it's going to help that movement way more because they're already learning, you know, how to, whether they're lefty or righty, you know, to do that movement. So 100%. I, and that's why, I feel, you know, and then you give them a, a, a larger, you know, you give them a larger ball, and it's, like, the hand size is a little smaller, so there's a lot of, like, high throwing versus yes. top. So, you know, there's like that, the elements of should the athletes use a smaller ball when they're younger and then progress, you know, baseball stays the same forever. That's <laughs> you know, crazy. So, the weight doesn't like, really, I don't even know if the weight changes. No, nah, it's the same weight, same size, but softball, it's like 10 inch, 11 inch, 12 inch. So like maybe 
some of the younger girls should be using maybe tennis balls or like eight inch softballs or something else. So, so they can like feel yes. the load back versus so it's just a thought, you know, just a thought. But uh, I love that. Uh, like I, I'm working with infielder now who like she'll catch the ball and her chest will start to move to her target before she wants to rotate. So now it's like if you're a righty hitter and you start with your front side open and you're in there, like, no, you're not going to have good direction and you've lost half of your power potentiation anyway. So it's like, I love sure. that. Like, that's a great correlation to like, because pitchers, they don't coil as much as I would think. Like, it's it's a pretty square to their target. It's more of like a sagittal plane loading. A little front, obviously frontal plane, but like it's more sagittal back forward. So if you have a pitcher who's constantly doing that, like it's rotations is foreign to them in the sense of like in exactly. that manner. So reach and pull, like your scat reach and pull is something that like in the past cu- couple months, like much has been like a video I saw, like we were – I'm like, I got yeah uh, guys and girls who aren't rotating well. So for them to explore elbow height, right? And if mm-hmm. it starts in front, it has to go mm-hmm. back, which I need. Sure. So if this starts middle and I just can get this to out to where I'm going, then I have an opportunity to not only create rhythm, power, and then mm-hmm. timing. And then I could speed up the variance. I could change my shapes. I can move my feet. But the reach and pull, guys, go to Coach Austin, high level throwing, whichever one you want. You gotta find his reach and pull stuff. I think it's tremendous for exploring rotation, like like you've you've told me before. Yeah, this one's a great one. Also, this um, this kind of like bent elbow move where it's kind of like it's like an up and over. It just helps athletes like feel their shoulder blade a little bit more. It's it's great for you know for fast pitch athletes, but if you have a, a kid that's like pushing the ball, that might be kind of a nice one just like to feel and then make your throw from air so it's again it's like fluid movements from back to for you know to forward learning weight shift yeah before i forget coach the front side something that i'm super hot on that like studying the best throws in the world on our just a routine throw like ball stays middle right and i i i've got like a characteristic again like i'll see infielders when they bring the ball to middle their mm-hmm. wrist will be facing the sky. And I'm like, yeah. ah, like I do it already. And it just puts me into such internal rotation from the start and it's stiff, it's tight. And then, and it starts to create this first. That's how like I'll mm-hmm. unravel or it, it like uncoils back in an unrhythmic uh, manner. But like, I don't want to see guys, like I don't want to see your, your wrist facing the sky. Like we got to be a little more either thumb up, left thumb up or palm to my chest to be relaxed, to allow us to slot into whatever we want. I can't throw from a lot of windows from here. So, okay. Say we, say we fix that. Um, the next thing I like, I, I, I think is huge right now is like when I separate my, my hands midline, my left thumb, my glove side thumb goes down right like it naturally just goes down to keep this side tight to keep my like back arm as it loads into slot right and then from there like i think the play the speed of play like really just dictates how long this gets your front side elbow extension is based on speed and and slot and then from there coach like on a routine throw like we were talking about it goes thumb down and then thumb up Right. Like I'll see some people who separate their hands and their thumb will stay up and then they get into this unraveling around the ball and the, the, their that. wrist gets outside it. Right. But if I'm here and I'm tight, get separate my elbows. And then we just talk about like elbows work together. Right. Like that's rotation. If my elbows could sequence together, I'm probably going to unravel pretty well. But like so thumb down, thumb up, thumb down, like loading, unloading, loading, unloading. What do you got? Yeah, I, I I agree. I like a lot of athletes are thumb down, you know, they're not that like, number one, they don't like, this was a problem too. And like you're teaching how to like load the yes. arm, it's like the wrists are straight up and it's just like. I've gone through this phase coach. I've gone through that phase. I, I did too. I did too. So you, you can get through that, but <laughs> I, I like how it's more, more natural, like palms facing you, like the side of your wrist is, is facing up to the sky. But yes, like thumb is going to work kind of down. So that's going to help. Just keep your left shoulder, your left side shoulder closed a little bit longer. Yes. Some athletes that again do this, like they're already going into early rotation. And a lot of softball players who pitch, you know, because they're like 
their glove yes. side is we, we see like when they throw they're like their glove side yep. is up and they're like their torso is already going almost forward versus back to then yes. so yeah yeah and again the degree of like elbow extension is going to be based on the time speed of runner all that good stuff and yeah i, I like it awesome coach I feel like this podcast was for me and you to catch up and, and oh, geek out, great, but man. it's always a freaking blast. It just throwing is this beautiful evolving art. And I like, I, it's something that I, I play close attention to because I think you have to, um, we haven't even talked about tracking skills, like the ability to track the ball into a, a slot and catch the ball, but sure. coach, Thank you so much for your time. Before we get going, like, is there any like closing thoughts? Maybe if you're like hot on something, or you just want to a let people know what you got going on, where they can find yeah. you. Um, sh- have at it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I hope um you know whoever's listening in on this learns something and it's going to make some changes and just try it, at least to implement this stuff. Look at your throwers a different way. You know, look at the characteristics. What does their arm do? What does their hips do? What does their lead leg do? What does their glove side do? And then you'll have a better understanding and idea of how to actually train for them. So I just wanted to, you know, kind of hope you guys get this, you know, it is complex, but you try and implement it the best you can. Um, but yeah, you can, I mean, you can find our stuff. We're at high level throwing.com, all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. We'll post lots of good, you know, instruction and, you know, training based videos and educational tutorials, stuff like that. So, um, we have some you know, clinics coming up all through the spring into the summer. Um, How does that work, stuff. Coach? You, I see a lot of organizations yeah. kind of they can reach out to you, and then they have obviously athletes. So how do they go about that? Yeah, if you're interested in the clinic, you can email us. Um, if you have an organization or, or a group of teams um, that you really want to learn the program, uh, email us. We'll send you the details. Um, we'll choose a date, and you know we'll give you the information, and we'll confirm it so it's pretty easy just reach out if you have players there's a minimum which we send in the email but um you get all that information so yeah we're 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 getting booked right now through may so if you're you know want to bring us out just hop on the schedule and, and reach out uh, and then we have some you know we have a bunch of books coming out um, i have some advanced concepts training books more for position specific training like infielders outfielders catchers like really geared towards them um, we're getting our books translated to Spanish and Japanese, which is really cool. Let's go. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we have some other stuff coming out later in the year that, you know, maybe can hop on for podcast number three, you know, episode Let's... three and, and, and talk about it. <laughs> we're going to be so organized yeah. and professional by season three. It's going to be crazy. So, but yes, um, if you have any questions, you can always email me Austin at high level throwing.com for general questions or clinic um, inquiries. So. Thank Coach, you. again, I can't thank you enough for coming back on, and I can't thank you enough for the impact you've had on my journey as a, a not only just an infield coach, but a, a throwing coach. Mike, you've really given me a great foundation, and I, I, you could have, if you're a parent, a coach, a player, curious about anything of the stuff that we talked about, it's all in Coach's textbook in a really, really you know clear and concise manner that I think everyone needs to read because it's it's sad to see some of the throwers that we have in front of us that are being taught some things that are, you know, are dangerous. So coach Austin Washington, the game needs to hear more of you and you're doing such an amazing job as is. And I'm just very thankful that we've got the cross pass and I get to bounce ideas off you and, and have you on the dig it podcast. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. That means a lot. Thank you for the support, man. And you know, I love, I love joining the podcast always. So, um, I can't wait for, for episode three, man. Appreciate that. You're the man, coach. We'll see you soon. Yes, sir.